So you were traveling across the Atlantic Ocean in a kayak, and halfway across the ocean, you run into a storm. The kayak flips, and you black out, only to wake up sometime later on a deserted island. At this point, you were parched. The salt water looks tempting, but you know that drinking it will make matters worse. So what do you do now that you have no easy access to water? What will you do in order to ensure that you have fresh water supplies for drinking? Think about it. Hello everyone, this is a video lesson which covers the basics of groundwater flow, specifically the use of Bernoulli's equation and Darcy's law as they apply to groundwater. Groundwater flow covers the basics of underground water flow and includes advanced material like physics and continuum mechanics. As such, this video may work best for older students familiar with basic physics principles like the conservation of energy and Newton's laws. Trey Gissentaner is the original author of this lesson plan, and support for the development of this lesson is given by the NSF through funding of the Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom Projects at Ohio University. Hopefully by now you have thought about this question a bit and you may have an answer ready. Perhaps the title of this video gave it away immediately. Yes, you should start digging a hole because there's water underground. In fact, for every foot of fresh water above sea level, there might even be 40 feet of fresh water below sea level. This ideal relationship is known as the gibbon erzberg lens and occurs because less dense fresh water sits on top of the denser salt water. The result is a lens of fresh water. Salt water from the sea flows into the ground and underneath the fresh water. If your island gets enough rainfall and has porous soil underneath, you might be able to sustain yourself for a while with groundwater. You'll just need to dig a well first. Before we jump right into groundwater flow, we'll start by reviewing basic concepts related to water resources. Then we'll get into the more complicated stuff like the Bernoulli's equation, the definition of hydraulic conductivity, and Darcy's law and some of the applications. At the end of this video, you should have sufficient knowledge about groundwater flow, so I'll introduce an activity for you to try at, your, at home or in a classroom. Hopefully you aren't saying, what's this, when you see this image, but let's go over it just in case. This is the tried and true water cycle, a model of how water is moved around the earth. It works like this. Water stored in the ocean is heated sufficiently by energy supplied by the sun. Due to the heat energy, a fraction of this water evaporates, changing from liquid water to gaseous water vapor. The water vapor rises, reaching a height where it is cool enough to condense. As enough water condenses high up in the atmosphere, clouds are formed. Smaller clouds become larger clouds, and eventually a portion of this water falls out of the sky back to the earth. This is called precipitation. The precipitated water will do one of two things at this point, either infiltrate into the grounds or stream across the surface. Water which infiltrates into the ground will end up as groundwater, while the surface water, water will find its way to larger surface bodies of water, like lakes, streams, and large rivers. Either way, the cycle completes itself as river water and groundwater resupplies the ocean along coastal boundaries. So concerning our fresh water, Relatively speaking, there isn't a whole lot of it. Only 3% of the total water on Earth is fresh water, while the remaining 97% is salty ocean water. So most of the water on Earth is actually completely undrinkable right out of the gate. A large portion of fresh, fresh water is stored in the ground and underground streams of water called aquifers, 30% in fact, which makes groundwater a very enticing source of fresh water. Comparing this 30% of groundwater with the 0.3% we have in surface water, and considering that the rest is locked up in ice caps and glaciers, I think we've found the largest source of easily accessible fresh water, groundwater. Our groundwater is drawn from wells which are bored into the earth. Like drinking the soda from a straw, we can pull water from aquifers to get an ample supply of fresh water. If you don't know what aquifers are, they are essentially underground water reservoirs. Water underground flows slowly through small pores in the soil. Below the groundwater table, the soil pores will be completely saturated with water. These soil pores form a network of space for water to move around. Watch this YouTube video in the link for more information on groundwater and aquifers. There are essentially two types of aquifers, confined and unconfined. An unconfined aquifer includes groundwater below the water table with no upper boundary preventing water from flowing further downwards. In lieu of an upper boundary, these aquifers have a lower boundary which prevents or significantly slows the rate of water flowing downwards. You can think of this kind of aquifer as being an underground river. There isn't a defining upper confining layer in a river, 
but there is a bottom channel. Similarly, the water table is like the surface of the water in a river. It fluctuates depending on the season and amount of precipitation. On the other hand, a confined aquifer has both an upper and lower boundary, which significantly slows or prevents upward or downward flow of water. You can think of this kind of aquifer as a pipe. Water flows fully through it, but cannot escape from the walls of the pipe, unless there is a leak. So how does water flow underground? I mentioned before that soils have small pore spaces, which allow for movement of water underground. But how does this water move? What are the actual physical drivers of groundwater movement? The explanation for groundwater flow was developed by Henry Darcy, the man in the photo. In 1856, Darcy devised a series of experiments to analyze how water flows through porous media, specifically how water flows through porous soils. He poured water on top of a cylindrical apparatus filled with porous soil. The image on the right is his apparatus. Making sure to keep the water level a constant height above the soil, he measured pressure heads at different points within the column. Darcy established this groundwater flow equation based on his observations. The flow of water, Q, is equal to the product of the hydraulic gradient, I, area of the media through which the water is flowing, A, and the coefficient of permeability of the soil, K. In short, Q is equal to K I A. He found that water moved through highly porous soils like gravel or sand at a much faster rate than less permeable, permeable soils like clay or solid rock. In a moment, we will go over each variable one by one, starting with the coefficient of permeability, K. The coefficient of permeability is a measure of the aquifer soil's ability to allow for the flow of water. This coefficient accounts for both soil and water properties, so it depends on both the fluid, which is water in this case, and the soil makeup of the aquifer. K has units of velocity in increments like centimeters per second or inch, inches per second, and is often very small. Poor soils like sand and gravel will have a larger K than clays and solid rock. Look at the difference between gravel and clay on the charts of the right. The coefficient is about 1 million to 100 million times larger for gravel compared to clay. This means that water flows through sandy soils much faster than it does through clay soils. Remember how I mentioned the confining soil layers in a confined aquifer? The layers are composed of clay and rock materials and have very small values of K relative to the aquifer material itself. This impedes flow vertically. Water will instead travel through the porous aquifer along the steepest hydraulic gradient. This brings us to the next variable in Darcy's equation, the hydraulic gradient. But first you might ask what a gradient actually is. Well, a gradient is simply a change in the value of a quantity with a change in a given variable. Most often, it is the change in the value of a quantity with a change in distance in a given direction. For example, in summer when you run a window AC unit, the temperature near the doorway will be warmer than near the AC unit. The change in temperature between the doorway and the AC is an example of a temperature gradient in the direction of the doorway to the AC. Other examples of common gradients are pressure gradients and concentration gradients. So which gradient do you think describes the hydraulic gradient for groundwater flow? Is it an energy gradient? A temperature gradient? How about a concentration gradient? The hydraulic gradient is actually an energy gradient. The fundamental principle behind the hydraulic gradient is a change in energy from one point to another. Water flows from a point of high energy to a point of low energy. The energy of a fluid at any given point may be described by Bernoulli's principle. The Bernoulli's equation describes the conservation of energy for the flow of water and can be derived from the conservation of energy or Newton's second law of motion. This equation states that the energy of a fluid at a starting point denoted with subscript 1, is equal to the energy at another point, subscript 2. The energy of a flowing fluid can be broken down into pressure, velocity, and elevation components. The equation shown is manipulated mathematically to provide units of feet for each component, and we call each term a head. This value represents the height a liquid will rise in a tube due to each component. It should be noted that this form of the equation is ideal and does not account for energy losses due to friction. We can modify this equation to suit Darcy's law by removing the velocity component of head. This is because, relative to the other terms, the velocity head in groundwater flow is very small and may be omitted. 
Water flows through soil at a very slow rate, and it can therefore be ignored in energy calculations. For any given point within an aquifer, the energy of water may be calculated from the sum of the potential energy head and the elevation head. The value of head width can be obtained using observation wells. The level to which water rises in the well is the total head at that point. Finally, using this relationship, the hydraulic gradient between two points is simply the difference in head between those points over the length the water travels along the aquifer. In this drawing of, of an unconfined aquifer, the elevation is measured from an arbitrary datum below the aquifer to the lowest point in the well for both wells. The pressure head then extends the water table. Length is measured in a perpendicular line to the aquifer as shown. We will now use these relationships to solve an example problem. For the aquifer in the image here, find the flow rate, Q, of water from point A to point B. The cross-sectional area of the aquifer is 50 feet by 50 feet, and the perpendicular distance between wells is 100 feet. The first step is to convert K from units of centimeters per second to units of feet per second. Knowing that there are 2.54 centimeters in an inch and 12 inches in a foot, we divide the original value by 2.54 to convert to inches per second, then multiply by 1 over 12 to convert to feet per second. The value for k in feet per second is then 3.28 times 10 to the negative 8 feet per second. Next, we calculate the change in head between point A and B using the governing equations shown. The elevation head at A is 30 feet, while the pressure head is 38 feet. This gives a total head at A of 68 feet. Similarly, the total head at point B is 49 feet. The difference in head between these two points is then 68 feet minus 49 feet, or 19 feet. To calculate hydraulic gradient, we then divide the change in head by the perpendicular length between wells. This gives 19 feet divided by 100 feet, or 0.19 feet per feet, a unitless quantity. This states that for every foot of length along the aquifer, there is a 0.19 feet drop in head. Next, we calculate the aquifer area and rate of groundwater flow. The area of the aquifer and the direction of flow is simply 50 feet by 50 feet, which gives a 2,500 square foot area. Now that we have everything we need, we can solve for the flow rate of water through this aquifer using Q is equal to KIA, Darcy's Law. The flow rate is then 1.56 times 10 to the negative 5 cubic feet per second, or 1.35 cubic feet per day. We can see from this example that this is not a lot of water. This mostly has to do with the very low coefficient of permeability. We will now wrap up our discussion on groundwater flow by going over several applications important to groundwater. You have already seen how to calculate the rate of flow in an aquifer, so we'll now go over how we can control groundwater flow using earthen dams. Being able to efficiently impede, halt, or control groundwater flow is important for the safe operation of an earth dam. These massive structures are designed to trap water behind a large mass of well-stratified soil. They are used to store water for recreation, energy, drinking, flood control, and quality conservation. Modern earth dams are designed with an impervious core of soil or concrete at the center of the structure to prevent excessive groundwater seepage. One of the most common failure modes for earthen dams and other dam types is erosion of soil caused by seepage flow. Seepage erosion opens up small channels in the soil which get progressively larger over time. To combat against erosion, filters made of well-graded gravel are placed in highly susceptible areas of the dam. Usually, this is around the abutments, core, and spillway sections of the dam. These filters halt erosion and allow for proper drainage of groundwater seepage. Additionally, earthen dams are graded with gentle slopes on each side, with the upstream side having a slightly flatter slope to provide additional stability. For the rest of this video, I will provide instructions on how to construct your own earthen dam. Instructions for this activity are accompanied with associated lesson plan for this video. The finished product should look something like the two images shown here. This activity works best in groups of three to four. Your group will start out by choosing the type or types of soil you wish to use for your dam. Clay, sand, topsoil, and gravel should all be provided by your instructor. It is best to use a plastic container to build your dam in, 
as we will be testing it for its ability to halt seepage for groundwater flow. You'll want to pack the soil material tightly into a triangular form, having a maximum height of at least 3 inches. The result should look a little something like this image shown. After building your dam, fill one side with water to a height of 3 inches. You'll probably want to measure first and mark the height with a black permanent marker. Upon filling, record the time that you completed your dam, then set it aside for the day. The next day, at the same time, take the black permanent marker and measure the height of water which seeped through your dam to the other side. Also take length and width measurements of the water and multiply this by the marked height to get the total volume of water. Divide by one day to get the seepage flow rate right through your dam. The lower this number, the better your dam will have performed. This marks the end of this video. If you wish to learn more about groundwater flow, watch these videos from other books fellows. Additionally, you can perform the constant head permeability activity associated with this lesson plan. Thank you for watching.